Let me move this out of my way here. So, like I said a second ago, thank you everyone for taking time to join us. On behalf of myself and the Redox team across the U.S., uh, we appreciate each one of you, your interests in Redox, as well as your uh, continued to support with our uh, our products in the field. So uh, thank you. The idea the idea for today is uh, I'm going to share with you a few ideas that I've learned over my career in agriculture been a 12 been 12 long years so far <laughs> got a long ways to go still but uh, along the lines of production possibilities and uh, formulating a decision making framework that each of you can utilize on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, the, the topic uh, at hand today and recognizing the the challenges that 2020 has uh, imposed on many of us from COVID-19 due to some very unforgiving mother nature events, wind events, and some environmental conditions that aren't the most favorable. You know, there's a, there's a few weeks here of some pretty tough decisions that have to be made. And so just to kind of preface a few ideas, we're going to talk specific to potatoes. I got a little segment on some sugar beets and we'll finish up with a, a little bit on corn. I hope that each of you will be able to kind of read between the lines and figure out kind of how these principles may be adjusted for your cropping systems, whether it's onions, looking at single centers or double centers to, you know, tomato production and looking at, uh, you know, cluster growth on grapes. Well, those are the kind of, kind of concepts we're going to cover. And so, See how I get this thing to advance here. Okay, so take a look at this picture. Okay, you're an agronomist, you gotta evaluate what's going on in this, in this field. And you recognize very quickly that uh, there's some variability at hand. And so as we think about production possibilities and this decision-making framework, you know, if we were to define production possibilities, it's the measurement of production efficiency based on available resources. Most of the time we have to provide a level of information to the grower that allows him to decide whether or not to buy a product, make an application, or in the grower's sake, you know, how to implement the correct management strategy that's going to benefit this crop. So a lot of the times what we see in just general observation is variability in stands. You know, uh, maybe it's an emergence issue. Maybe it's a germination issue from a seed quality problem. Maybe there's some nutritional issues that we've got to address. Um, in potatoes, I've learned over the years, a lot, of, a lot of what we see in terms of variability relative to stand is sometimes a seed, seed size problem which translates into a stem distribution problem and essentially into a fruit load issue or tuber load in this certain instance. And so the first, uh, the first principle we're going to discuss today is stem distribution in potatoes and how that, how that can affect um, end user quality, size, nutrient input, so on and so forth. And so here's a law. I don't know that it's a law in Florida as much as a law as it, is, as it is here in Idaho, but the law states the more stems you have, the more tubers you'll have translates into less size. So more stems equals more tubers equals less size. For a processed French fry grower, that's a pretty big deal to the seed potato grower or the, or the fingerling or small potato grower. This is maybe a little more in line with what they're actually shooting for. But for us in Idaho, large percentage of our crop goes to fresh market table stock produce, as well as making French fries, hash browns, and so on and so forth. The idea is the bigger the spud, the higher the level of recovery 
big blocky nice tubers the size of hundred dollar bills if that's what you're packing around but how does this how does this translate into the framework that we have to manage under you know as we go throughout our day-to-day -day, um, conversations with distributor reps growers you know processors you know how does this relate and so as we've as we've looked at this over the years you know this was a big deal to me back when i was on the farm managing potato the agronomy on potatoes and other various crops it became it became very evident over the years that as stem number increases along the bottom axis there size also decreases and so with that comes some serious challenges an example here is some some uh, some variability in what we're discussing in terms of stem distribution in potatoes look at the characteristics of this two stem plant compared to a six stem plant and you think for a minute, man, if I could have all two stem plants in a field, I'd be, I'd be sitting pretty. Well, that's not, that's not necessarily a reality. We get a lot of variability across the field. And the idea behind stem distribution is to understand the percentage of one stem, two stem, three stem, four stem plants across the field so that we can understand, you know, what our production possibility is obviously if i'm a producer in idaho i'm really looking to that two stem number or three stem number to give me the best possible outcome in terms of size profile you know if i'm a if i'm a small potato grower in wisconsin maybe i'm maybe i'm looking at that six stem plant thinking man that that's going to give me a high percentage of two inch or three inch potatoes that, uh, that fit my market. And so a lot of this is relative to kind of an end in mind, you know, where, where are we going with these spuds? What's the desired use for these potatoes and how do we max out the size profile that's give, gonna give the best ROI potential downstream. And so as you look here, here's a three stem plant with our distribution graph to the right there as you look at this you know three stems pretty good average get some big spuds we get some small spuds it's probably ideal for a fresh pack grower carton producer that's looking for a lot of variability in carton size you know 60s 70s you know 40 80 count cartons but in terms of actual production if we're at a three stem average in this field 50% of what we produce is going to be under six ounces. So as we move to four or five, six stem plants, we see that the number of small potatoes sure really increases quickly compared to having large potatoes, which are always fairly easy to sell. And so kind of give you guys a, a baseline for what we're talking about here. I think this has some merit for, you know, you tomato guys, yeah, even some merit to the, to the grape guys and even into the apples. You know, this concept of stem distribution was brought to me probably 10 years ago from an apple grower in Washington. He says, you know, we really got to look at look at our branches we got to look at what the fruit set is and really manage to that level and so what does all this matter to you or to the end to the end grow to the end producer the grower and what does this matter you know in the background of this picture you see a, a storage being filled with potatoes that are likely to be gone be gone to a processor sometime may or june of the next year so we want to make sure that bad boy's filled with uh, as many prime payables as possible. And so how do we get to that point? You know, let's talk acre efficiency for a minute. Because not a, there's not any one of us here today that doesn't consider this concept at some point as being one of the major drivers in our decision making. And so if we're looking at acre efficiency, 
yeah, we've got a very high stem number in our potato management system under that field. We're looking at a lot of weak, unproduct unproductive stems. And so as we look at unproductive growth, we see slower growth rates. We get weak stems that are prone to disease. We see increases in water demand, as well as fertility input requirements increase. And essentially we get to levels of inconsistent growth. Tuberization happens at different stages. Flowering happens at different stages. We get a lot of variability. And so if you're out there trying to make a decision on whether to apply a white mold protected spray on your spuds right prior to row closure, but you're watching your bloom as the indicator when you want to get those petals covered up before they fall to the ground, you want that field to be as uniform as possible so that that application has the highest efficiency potential for the year. And so I think that's true for a lot of our inputs as well, whether it's a crop protection input of some sort or fertility input. You know, the variability of the field has a lot to do with how efficient that application is utilized. And we see in high stem situations on a Russet Burbank level, you know, slower growth rates, weak stems, prone to disease. I can about guarantee you, you guys that are in the potato business, first sign of early blight this year that you'll see will be from a high stem number plant that's it's got a huge ton of biomass, got a lot of energy pumping into it, probably a weaker root system and a huge tuber load. So there's a lot of, lot of demand on that plant to sustain a balanced you know, energy profile across vegetative growth, tuber growth, and sustained root growth as well. And so as we move in and look at stem nutritional status, what's interesting to me over the years, we've kind of concluded that in that first, first 45 days after emergence, we go from having a very small plant at emergence to row closure in the space of 30, 40, 45 days, in which case this graph represents our total nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium uptake is a percentage of seasonal input. So by 45 days, you're looking at a peak in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium demand from 45 days out till the end of your management window. That trend really stays somewhat flat, tapers off towards the end, which I think is, uh, is an indicator of pretty standard management scenarios. The idea behind this that I hope to present to you at this stage here is the, uh, the concept of managing vegetative growth versus managing reproductive growth energy and what that means in terms of general production. And so obviously a higher stem number plant's gonna have a huge vegetative energy just cause you got such a massive plant, a lot of biomass to feed but a significant dilution factor takes place if you're measuring nutrient based on petiole analysis or leaf tissue analysis compared back against like a two stem plant. And I think there's some, there's some variability in that. If we could pull, if we could pull a two or three stem plant field, two or three stem plant across the whole field, I think we'd see some unique in, we'd see some unique differences between an average, which I hope is what most all of us are shooting for, is to get a good average. But back to understanding stem distribution, if we can go out at rosette time, eight to 10 inch rosette, do some count and count, you know, 100 plants, count 200 plants, whatever tickles your fancy the best, gives you the, the greatest uh, level of confidence, you know, Count 100 plants and figure out the percentage of ones, twos, threes compared to fours, fives, sixes. And you'll have a pretty good baseline for what that field is going to be throughout the rest of the season. And as you, as you look to your nutrient, nutritional considerations, you have a pretty good basis for, you know, high stem number probably requires a little more of a aggressive input 
management scenario compared to a lower, say a two or a three average, it's gonna require maybe a little less or more of a maintenance type program. And then when we calculate tuber load, you know, if we start looking at actual tubers per plant based on that stem number, then we've got a pretty good idea, you know, where we're at. So Ray, let's, uh, let's look at your question. You got a question here. Let me figure out how to get to that. No, I, I, I was, uh, I was looking at it and I had over, but what's day D A E days after emergence. I was wondering what the E was really. Yeah, days after emergence. So prorate, prorate from planting about 30 days. So add 30 days to that and you'd have from a plant kind of calculation. Okay, so let's move to this next uh, concept here. Same scenario, stem nutritional status days after emergence but we're looking at calcium magnesium manganese iron boron copper i don't know why zinc didn't show up here but it should be there and follows a very similar trend so as we look at our nutritional input requirement for the season the well, micronutrients play a pretty key role on a very very uh definitive basis throughout the season and i'm guilty for a lot of years overlooking this concept is that micronutrients were applied in a deficiency situation where the pedio came back, zinc's low, boron's low, schedule the airplane on the next ride, throw a little zinc and boron in it, right? Yet as we look at as we look at the concept of managing vegetative growth as well as reproductive growth. There's a little more of an intense level of management taking place when we calculate the demand for micronutrient application, as well as some of, the, some of our base cations, calcium and magnesium. And so this, this was kind of interesting to really put a finger on over the years is looking at actual nutritional demand and how, you know, if we go back, you see nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium really kind of taper off as the season progresses, where a lot of your micronutrients kind of maintain a relatively high um, application requirement. Not large in volume, but just the need for a constant supply. And so when we consider plant stress response, when we look at hormone balance and the cofactors that drive hormone synthesis in the plant, when we look at enzymatic activity that fuels a lot of our metabolic action in the plant, you know, even into photosynthesis and respiration, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these micronutrients are key drivers in those processes. And as far as nutritional input, you know, we can't overlook carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as well in that entire system. And so over the years, looking at this concept of stem distribution and potato management, come to the conclusion that high stem count fields lead to greater in nutrient input costs. And this is just a comparison we've run over the last few years looking at russet Burbank production, comparing a three 08 stem count to a 383 stem count and then looking back at total nutrient input for the year just as a maintenance program to maintain a valuable or a steady value of pedial analysis trying to keep everything balanced trying to hold things from really crashing you know, just a good standard management strategy this is how we translate you know $48 an acre increase with a, almost a full stem difference across the field. And so when you're looking at dollars and cents and you're looking at return on investment, that's pretty significant increase in dollar spend when the law, potato law says more stems, more tubers, less size. And so it translates to that again. So as we look at that same comparison in actual 
tuber profile, you know, the percentage of six ounce or larger tubers in those same fields, we're spending 48 more dollars to get almost 10% less in large potatoes. And so that becomes very costly in terms of overall production. And so I hope each of you can kind of see how this level of framework, you know, taking what resources are available to us, applying them in the field while we're out scouting and looking, you know, as we're looking for bugs, we're looking for disease, you know, take a minute and start to understand what the crop's telling you as well. You know, look at, uh, look at your stem counts on these potato fields and just kind of get an idea of where, you know, where you're sitting. You don't have to count the whole farm. You count three or four random fields, count some early planted, count some late planted, count some middle stuff, and just see see where you're at. And I'll bet you see a you know a half to three quarters of a stem increase as you know uh, the season go as the planting season goes along. And so then you then you got a pretty good baseline for how to you know how to manage your inputs. So in terms of managing reproductive energy, let's, let's look at a scenario where you have a potato crop that you wish you had a few more tubers set on. Maybe it's a Western russet, maybe it's an agata, maybe it's some cool purple skin variety out in Wisconsin, I don't know. Let's say you need to improve your tuber set. You've got all the criteria, all the criteria is met, you got a good stem average, but you're just short on tubers. So when we talk about managing reproductive energy, there's tools available to each of you to really encourage the plant to give you more you know, reproductive type growth. One of the ways we do that is with our product called RX Supreme. We can apply this material at hooking at one pound per acre and see a pretty substantial improvement to tuber set. Now this is this is a great tool. This is not an application for every field, every variety, but it should be should be considered in situations where you think you should have just a few more tubers to get you into that size profile that you're really looking for. Now with that comes the comes the necessity to increase the plant's staying power, which allows it to hold on to those tubers. It's pretty easy to tell that plant, hey, take some of your stored carbohydrate, convert that into proteins, amino acids, energy that would promote uh, tuber set, and then uh, then what do you do? You know, you can promote that easily, but all of a sudden there's an increase in nutritional requirement that says, hey, I got to have just a little bit more to hold on to what I've just produced, and so that's where this 10-day post-application app comes in with uh, with dicap and triplex micro so we can encourage the plant to set more crop but we have to supply the plant with the reproductive energy it needs to sustain it trust me i've cost myself a lot of dollars in this scenario where i've set tubers that we couldn't hold on to because our follow-up nutrition was not adequate enough and so if you're going down this road, make sure that you have, uh, have that follow-up application in mind. Um, trust me, it pencils every time in terms of uh, tuber production. This little combination right here is extremely valuable. Let me show you one more scenario that would come into, come to be very beneficial in terms of managing reproductive growth. For those of you interested in kind of a stay green type effect later in the season, you know, 30, 40 days before vine kill, here's a, here's a comparison of a couple different applications we've played with over the years that have proven to be quite profitable. Um, simulated frost applications have been kind of a, a standby as a tool to kind of stress that plant or trick it into encouraging overall tuber bulking. And you'll see that in these two bars on the right side of the screen, eight ounce frost application or simulated frost, 16 ounce simulated frost. 
that's a that's a light treatment of uh, a desiccant trying to blow the tops out of the crop to get them to shift their metabolism into more of a tuber bulking type phase when we looked at the comparison using oxycom calcium and dicap in two different combinations we see where potassium and phosphorus are two key very key drivers in managing reproductive energy and so we can really move a lot of carbohydrates very quickly with these two chemistries that show a very nice bump in yield potential. Now granted, this is small scale testing, you know, 10, 15, 20 acre blocks at a time. It's not the whole farm. And so there's probably a level of, of uh, uh, reevaluating that needs to take place here. But the last couple of years, this has shown to be very influential in helping get to the size profile we need very critical for growers trying to hit early early market windows trying to encourage uh you know trying to get to a little higher size profile quicker it's still very much a time driven driven process and there's a few critical factors that if they're not in check this uh, this this scenario will fail miserably and as we as we've learned a few lessons the hard way if our potassium is short, less than 12% in the patio, this won't work. If our stem number is too high and our tuber load is too high, this will not show a very favorable outcome. You'll see a bump in tuber size, but it won't be as substantial as what you see here. But when, when potassium and phosphate are, are, are uh, situated, in the patio in an ideal range when stem count and tuber count are ideal this can be very very valuable tool to each of you so hopefully that makes sense to you okay we're going to shift gears into a discussion on sugar beets this one's going to go quick because uh Beets are beets in my world. There's uh, there's some management strategy at planting that helps us get better uniformity and stand establishment. You know, ideally you want every beet to be a clone of itself. You know, the two pound beet across the whole field is gonna yield pretty handsomely. But as we have looked and tried to figure out ways to really maximize sugar beet production, both in sugar content as well as um, total yield, we've come to the conclusion that there's a few critical things a guy needs to consider. Cody, you have a question we could answer real quick? Let me figure out here what we got. Cody or Colton, you guys have a comment or question? Sorry, I accidentally clicked the button. Okay, no problem. Needed, I needed to catch my breath anyway. I'm rolling here. Okay, so in, in terms of sugar beet production, it's a pretty nice field if, if I don't say so myself. What we've seen over the years is when we look at later season management, kind of in that 190 to 100 day range, we start looking at beet growth, root growth compared to estimated yield in top growth, and comparing the inverse relationship those two can often have. In, in southern Idaho here, a lot of most growers, most management is finished up by row closure. And so into June, early July, fertility's done, crop protection applications are done. All we're gonna do is water that crop, right? And so, you know, here at 100 days is kind of the baseline for where management ends. Yeah, we got another, you know, 60, 50, 60 days where there's a lot of yield potential left in the 
left in the hands of mother nature as well as the sugar beet itself and as we as we've looked at uh kind of the physiological response beets have to fertility applications to water to heat to even the late august cool down and nighttime temps there's an interesting trend that we've come across is when when root growth or beet growth is up top growth is down which is ideal we want to take whatever energy stored in that leaf and move it to the to the root but we found you'll see in this these two graphs here estimated beet yield and estimated yield in tops we actually cannibalize beet growth to support new leaf growth and so that that becomes very expensive in terms of yield loss um, loss in sugar percentage and uh, some other very interesting concepts around like insect management black bean aphid leaf miner issues and stuff like that and so just a just an idea a concept for maybe some of you sugar beet growers that are on board here today be cautious that late season applications of fertility help drive you know, reproductive as well as vegetative growth that sustain a balanced growth rate. Ideally, we wouldn't see these dips and these peaks and valleys in this growth curve. We just see a nice smooth curve where things are sustained all season long, but we know that's not, it's not always possible. But if we can keep that beet from cannibalizing stored sugar, stored carbohydrates to grow new leaves, we'll be all the better for it. And so, um, yeah, I think that's probably all I want to share in that department. Um, let's move into corn. Uh, there's a lot more corn planted every year, especially this year with cutbacks in potato contracts and some of the issues relative to COVID 19. And so, corn's become a common cash crop for most operators in southern Idaho and the Great Basin Territory that I manage. And, uh, you know, we've got to points where, you know, we're, we're wanting to be corn warriors too. You know, we want some of them Randy Dowdy, David Hula type yield numbers. <laughs> we're not getting them. That's the problem. We're getting close, but we're not getting there on a sustainable basis. And so this last winter, You'll see in the left there, we with uh, with progressive crop systems, um, a couple of uh, supporting sponsors. We had Ken Ferry from uh, the Midwest um, Crop Tech Consulting out of Iowa come out and talk to us. Those of you that know Ken know he's pretty savvy guy in terms of uh, corn and corn production. And so we, we learned some very valuable insights from him this year that uh, we're going to go through a little bit. Um, the first of those is planning, okay? And I don't care what crop we're talking, corn, beets, onions, peppers. You know, there's, there's a significant genetic potential associated with every crop that we're, we're managing. And that potential is its highest as it sits as a seed in the bag. As soon as we plant it, guess what? That potential is cut and it's cut again as environmental factors are contributed, seed depths contributed, or fertility inputs are contributed. And so the idea behind a solid planting application is to help improve that seed cost investment. Um, Realistically, we want to maximize our, our uh, um, stand, get every, every, every seed to germinate, get every seed out of the ground, and to be as consistent as possible. Um, and we'll, along with that comes um, the importance of establishing a solid root system as early and as quick as possible. And so as we talk, as we talk genetic potential, one of the things we learned with Ken and 
some of his years of experience is that in terms of corn and the hybrid that you've chose to plant in each field has the potential to flex in several ear characteristics. And the first of those is flex in girth or the number of kernels around on the cob. This takes place from planting through V6. And so as, as uh, you know, as each of us was have it, we don't always get to make the decision about what the grower plants, but we have to manage that decision. You know, and take for instance, this spring here in Idaho, it's been cool, it's been wet. We see a lot of corn that's come up, it's yellow. We got some purple leaves showing. There's a lot of issues related to how well that corn is responding to environmental stress. So that stress is gonna cause a reduction in overall girth. You know, corn doesn't flex upward, it flexes downward, which means you're losing potential every day that that plant has to endure undue stress. And so when we, we, we plant the wrong hybrid into cool, wet soils, we don't have the heat potential, maybe we don't have our fertility quite right, we're losing girth or we're shifting from 18 around to 16 around you know what it's pretty quick 20 bushel right there and so what we lose in girth we have to be able to make up in length of length of ear or in kernel size and so we we like the inferral applications rutex root rx a few of you midwest guys are playing around with platinum that's really helping us get that crop up and going as quickly as possible. And so as we, as we shift forward into the V6 kind of category, V6 through V8, we're, we're fans of cutting that crop apart, breaking it loose down the middle and really opening it up to see what the vascular tissue is looking like. You know, you can see this, this vascular bundle right here. You, know, you start seeing a lot of discoloration in that tissue. You might consider some of your inputs and the, the issues that are at hand. Maybe it's a fusarium problem. Maybe it's a bacterial type problem. Could be a lot of things. But a, a good way to look at okay. uh, root development, uh, internal vascular system health. Uh, you can start dissecting uh, these crops to look at ear uh, ear development as well as seeing how many you know how many leaves are left how many nodes are still there to to come out um, in terms of corn production you know stress from the v6 growth stage clear out to tassel is going to shorten ear length um, this is relative to hot stress heat stress cold stress uh, moisture, you know, water management issues, as well as nutritional issues. And as we, as we look to manage these significant drivers, you know, corn can't have any stress days, period, end of story. And so we move into that tasseled R4, you know, we can abort kernels on the tip or we get a little tip back or kernels not filling clear out to the end of the cob. And so those are the, those are the two ways we lose potential in terms of ear length. And so it's relative to managing environmental stress as best we can. Um, like I said a bit ago, just a few pictures to kind of highlight where we're where we're looking at the corn, where we're really trying to see what our potential is. You know, obviously in these pictures, root development was kind of our focus, thinking, man, if we can build a solid root system and sustain solid root growth throughout the season, that's going to help us implement a lot of our foliar management strategies that allow us to to really influence ear length, girth, and depth of kernel. And uh, that's a good starting point, but it's not the end all be all. There's still a lot of things that we've got to figure out in the meantime. But 
for us, that's a pretty bang up root system. We hope we can replicate that again this year. Because obviously you see my boy Blake, you know, he's a big square guy, probably about six foot two, and that, that corn's easily a 12 foot taller better. I don't know if you can see it very well, but uh, we've got two ears on that uh, plant as well as a couple suckers. So we have what we have the energy, we have the nutrition right. We're just short of figuring out how to shove all that extra into ear growth. And then this last this last stage, as far as uh, ear flex, is in depth of kernel very very late season you know last 30 40 days of the season is when this this scenario can really be detrimental to kernel fill you know if we're if we're uh if we're short on potassium if we're running short on phosphorus you know the energy component of the plant if we're short potassium the starch translocation component of the plant we're going to see a lot of shift in uh, kernel test weight and density. And so management in those reproductive stages of growth becomes very critical. Um, you know, there's a lot of hybrids out there for you growers. You know, the understanding where your hybrid flexes or what the characteristics of, it ear, of its ear flex is, is something your seed rep's going to be able to tell you. But I've, I've found over the last two years that as we understand the concept of ear flex, we're better able to make management decisions that enhance those different scenarios. And so corn's always gonna flex backwards. You're gonna lose potential. You're not gonna gain it. But the idea of understanding where that particular variety flexes allows you the opportunity to really ramp up prior to that certain growth stage with you know applications like die cap micronutrients triplex micro um, maybe it's an amine form of, form of nitrogen to help carry you know some of your carbohydrate storage and so it becomes very very important to understand the hybrid you're dealing with and knowing where you could really potentially lose a lot of uh, a lot of yield a lot of opportunity. Um, varieties that flex in depth of kernel are very responsive to late season fungicidal applications. Um, more probably in term, more a benefit in terms of kind of the stay green, the hormonal type response you get out of like triazoles and different chemistries that way. We've actually found where that dicap oxycom combination gives us a very similar response in keeping that plant, uh, keeping photosynthesis moving, keeping respiration moving. Um, and I think as you look at evapotranspiration throughout the season, you'll start to understand why corn can move so much so fast in terms of carbohydrate translocation when ET rates are elevated. We're pulling a lot of water, a lot of moisture from the soil. That moisture is moving through the plant, and along with it goes uh, a lot of your nutrient to the kernel. And so hopefully those are a few key takeaways. You know, Ken, Ken Ferry's got a lot of information along this concept of ear flex available uh, through Farm Journal. Uh, found a lot of value from some of those Midwest publications. Um, but yeah, it's all about yield. So just in summary, um, in terms of production possibilities, when we look at when we look at stem distribution and tuber load, we're better equipped to make decisions relative to yield potential. Now that was one of the more frustrating uh, experiences for me at the farm level and it it continues to be equally as frustrating today is when when a guy will ask you cook if i make this application will it return me 50 percent will it turn me 120 percent and to not know the answer 
is is uh, a little disheartening. But I find that when I understand what the what the conditions the crop is, what the potential it has is, those decisions are easily more easily made. Um, acre efficiency. We want every acre on the farm to be producing at its highest possible potential. And that comes down to understanding water, understanding nutrient, and understanding the crop and the, the, the physiological characteristics that it maintains. Um, nutritional status, I think that's where every one of us spends a lot of time trying to understand crop input selection. You know, what 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 tool do I have at my disposal that's going to help mitigate stress? What tool do I have that's going to promote, you know, reproductive energy versus vegetative energy? You know, that's a very very critical um, concept at the moment. You know, we've got technology on our side that allows us the ability to manage on multiple levels within the plant not just your primary metabolic pathways but also you get into those secondary metabolic pathways that have a lot of potential in allowing that plant to deal with stress and overcome the environmental conditions that limit its overall potential you know, as we look at vegetative versus reproductive energy nitrogen is not always the answer you know, I, I've come across that numerous times throughout my career is nitrogen's easy to apply. It's a quick feel good type response. You see a quick green up, but sometimes it's a little conflicting because with the uh, increase in nitrate storage comes pest and disease problems. And so, you know, the, the consideration between vegetative and reproductive growth and the input that drives one versus the other or both is very critical and then in terms of in terms of the crop we're managing understand understand the, the variety you know understand what its performance characteristics are and can be and you'll never you'll never be disappointed in its overall performance when your expectations align with what it's actually capable of doing and then managing starch synthesis and translocation, true for all crops. That's where money's made. We got to build the cell, then we got to fill it out. And, uh, you know, as we focus our attention more to, uh, you know, potassium inputs, you know, micronutrient inputs, those tools that help sustain the metabolic activity of the plant, I think we'll all be better for it. And so that's uh, that's today's discussion. Again, on behalf of myself and the Redox team, we appreciate each one of you. Hope you found uh, value from the, the topic today. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, we could sure take a minute to answer those and see where we're at.